can give you something to eat, a place to sleep, a place we might write it in our notes this way. The teacher needs to protect the student, take care of the student, allow the student to grow up. But there will come a point when the teacher's job is to give the student a kiss on the cheek, open the gate and say, there it is, go, get out of here. The job of the teacher is to prepare the student to leave. The job of the parent is to prepare the student to leave. Mother came to me once, parent-teacher conferences. My daughter, she is driving me absolutely nuts. She has her own opinion about everything. She never does what she's told anymore. She goes on. And I said to her, wow, allow me to congratulate you. What an amazing mother you are. What? Did you not hear what I just said about how terrible my child is? I said, whoa, whoa, whoa. Do you honestly want a child who does absolutely everything you tell her to do? Really? That's the kind of child you want. An automaton, a robot, a zombie that just does everything she's told to do all the time. Or do you want a child who can make up her own mind? And when that process starts, it can be very unsettling to parents and teachers as well. It's the job of the teacher to make you prepared to live your life to answer the questions for yourself. Notice, now to finish, and these are lines that I've often challenged students to memorize. They are profound lines. Take a look at what he says. Long enough have you dreamed contemptible dreams. It's enough with the nightmares. Is he speaking literally or metaphorically? Metaphorically, right? Enough with the nightmares. Now I wash the gum from your eyes. Now, you don't understand what this means unless you understand that he grew up in the east where there's lots and lots of trees. Have you ever gone up on the mountain to cut down a Christmas tree and you reached out and you grabbed this clear liquid stuff that was really sticky? You guys don't call it gum here. You call it what? Sap, correct? You call it sap. That clear stuff. Now imagine if you took a bunch of that clear stuff off that tree and you put it on your eyes. Right? You just gunked a bunch of it on your eyes. How well could you see? Not at all. Look what he says. Now I wash the gum from your eyes. Are we talking literally? No, this is metaphorically. You must habit yourself, become accustomed, to the dazzle of the light and of every moment of your life. Enough with the, oh, my life is no good. All these terrible things have happened to me. I am. Nah, nah, nah. Women says, enough of that. You're, 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 enough with the nightmares. Enough with the contemptible dreams. It's time to recognize the dazzle of the light that's in your life. How precious your life is. It's yours to live. And he says, I'm going to challenge you to, to look at life differently. So we might write that down. The teacher's job is to challenge the student to look at life with hope, with optimism. Whitman is aware that sometimes adults can bring kids down. Sometimes parents can say things that bring kids down. Sometimes teachers can say things that bring kids down. I once taught a student who had failed a class, and I said, you're really bright. Why did you fail? That teacher told me I was stupid, and I quit. I just didn't care anymore. The teacher told you were stupid? Yeah, yeah, she said I was stupid, and so I just quit. And I was like, how could you ever allow another person to have that kind of control over you? That teacher told you you were stupid. That's one idiot's opinion. And you failed. That was your choice. That wasn't because of the teacher. This is his point. You have to begin to see your life as your life and the dazzle of your life. And then he uses an interesting word picture. Long have you timidly waited, holding a plank by the shore. He has a word picture that is almost funny. There you are, standing next to the ocean, and you've got this little piece of wood that you're holding on to, and you're walking back and forth on the beach as you're looking out into the water. What's with the wood? Why the wood? Wood floats. How come you need the wood? Because you're scared. Scared of what? You're scared that you might, right. See how that works? You might, you might be a little bit like, you know, oh no, oh no, right? See how that works? He says, I will you, he says, I dare you. You might circle the word will. I dare you to be a bold swimmer. Jump off in the midst of the sea. Rise again, nod to me, shout and laughingly dash with your hair. I love to, I love to tell the story of my boy Mikey, uh, who as a young man wanted a new bike. 
Mikey wanted a bike. And so I was like, all right, so I bring home this bike to him, and, and I get it out of the back of the truck, and I set it down. And immediately my Mikey goes, Dad, what's with those stupid tires on the back? And I said, son, those are training wheels. They're awesome. You'll love them. And he's like, take them off. They made me look dumb. I don't want training wheels. Uh, because his buddy next door didn't have training wheels on his bike. And I said, dude, just get on the bike. So my Mikey gets on the bike, and all of a sudden he starts leaning to fall. Uh, why is it we grab harder as we're falling? Okay, I'm not going to talk about love right now. But he leans at, you know, right? Uh, and then all of a sudden the training wheels catch him, and he looks up and I said, see, Mikey, awesome, huh? His training wheels. They, they, Mikey learns how to ride his bike with his training wheels. Oh, he is awesome all over the neighborhood. I remember the afternoon, I, I'm watching a ball game. Mikey comes in, he goes, Dad, I say, what? And he says, I think it's time I learned to ride my bike without my training wheels. I'm like, okay. And I just keep watching my ball game. And the, the next day, he goes out with his mom in the van. He comes home. There I am, standing beside the, the bike. Mikey gets out the van. Mikey's like, Dad, what you doing? And I said, hey, you, you said you wanted to learn how to ride your bike. Come on, this is awesome. Let's go. My Mikey, uh, no, I don't think today's a good day. What are you talking about? It's beautiful outside. Ma's got the camera. We're going to videotape. This is great. Come on, let's go. We're going to go out there on the front in, 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 the, in the street there. We're going we're gonna to ride your bike. Come on, let's go. My Mikey, no, I, I, I don't feel like riding the bike. What is my Mikey? He's a scared. He's a scared, ain't he? I go, Mikey, what's the problem? He goes, uh, I'm a little worried. Worried about what? Oh, I'm afraid I'm going to fall down. I said, oh, honey, you got no idea. We're about to go out on this street. You're going to get on this bike, and you're going to jack yourself something awful. It's going to be horrific. You're gonna, it's going to hurt something wretched. Let's go. We have a tendency to forget. The only way you ever learn anything is through fear and pain. It's the only way. It's the only way. My Mikey. We got it on videotape. There he is out there. Uh, if you've never had a chance to do this, I hope that you had this chance before you die. It's incredible. My Mikey on his bike, you know, one of these numbers, right? And I, you know how you do this? You hold on to the handlebar. You hold on to the seat. You know, I'm, I'm talking to him. You know, you're going to do fine. You're going to do fine. You know, and then all of a sudden I realize, I go, Mikey. He goes, what? And I said, son, I ain't going to push you all the way around the block. You're going to have to pedal. My Mikey's totally forgotten how to pedal. It's not like he doesn't know how, right? Okay. And so he starts pedaling and I'm doing one of those things where, yeah, you're doing great. You're doing great. And then all of a sudden, oh, what an incredible feeling. I let it go. And there he goes. Off. I'm like, yes, he's doing it. Oh, it's so awesome. You know, butt's coming, huh? Right, you know butt's coming, huh? Now, let's get this straight. Uh, Mikey knew the curb was there. He had seen it before. Do you got it? Mikey knew how to use his brakes. You rotate them backwards. He had done it before. Oh, dude, he hits the curb. Oh, it's the most beautiful jack. Over the handlebars, onto the sidewalk. The elbow, the knees, it's beautiful. It's beautiful. I mean, oh, so it's wonderful. I come running up. I'm so excited, Mikey, you did it, it was awesome, I love it, dude, awesome. You know, my Mikey, he's so mad, he's so mad, he's pushed that bike off of himself, he's pulled him little bloody knees up, he's got his arms around, he's got tears in his eyes, he is so mad. Now, let me point out something, he is not mad at the city engineer for putting the curb in the wrong spot, no. He is not mad at himself for forgetting how to use his brakes, no. My Mikey. Rah, stupid jerk dad. He's mad at Right? I say, come on, son, let's try it again. Oh, he's so hot. He gets up, he walks in the house, the camera's following as he goes. A couple of days later, he comes back, Dad, I think it's time to try again. All right. Man, for about two weeks, it looks like my kid's been through the war or something, you know what I'm saying? Oh, but the moment that he did it, it was awesome. There he goes. Off. We have forgotten, most of us. The, the way you learn stuff is to go through fear and pain. I was, I was doing this gig down in Houston, a few thousand people listening, and a mother raised her hand in the question and answer. She said, what are your thoughts, Mr. McGee, about failing? I said, oh, I deeply respect a student's right to fail. Yeah, yeah. If a student chooses to fail, I deeply respect that right. I will never humiliate the student. I want to help the student understand. This is your choice. You make this choice. Now this is what happens. These are the consequences. And the mother was just stunned by that. She's like, I can't believe you would even say that. And I said, you can. Is that your daughter sitting next to you? And she's like, yeah. Does she know how to ride a bike? And she goes, yeah. I said, did you teach her how to ride that bike? And she said, I did. I said, before you taught her to ride the bike, did you tell her you're about to go out and do this experience where you're going to fall down and it's going to hurt like Hades. Let's go. 
You knew it was going to hurt her, right? The mother now gets real silent. She said, understand it. I said, sounds like child abuse. Mm -hmm. See, here's the thing. We want to go through an experience where we learn stuff without ever having any pain. I did a gig in Jackson where I said, I was there to talk about school, so when they introduced me, all the kids groaned. I said, I don't want to talk about school, and all the kids went, yeah. I said, I want to talk about, I want to talk about snowboarding. I was doing this in the winter, and I'm in Jackson, and of course, I said, can we just do this? Let's just call school today and all go to the ski slopes, and I got somebody I want to pay $10,000 for the day. I'm ready to pay ten grand cash. I'm ready to pay ten grand cash because here's the deal. I've never been on a snowboard. I want to know how to do it. I got anybody who can teach me. Of course, a thousand hands go up, right? And I said, but wait a minute. You got to hear my rules. My rules are real simple. Uh, by the end of the day, if you're teaching me, I want to be as good as that guy with the crazy hair. Right? I want to be as good as Sean by the end of the day. And I want you to guarantee me that while you're teaching me, I'm never going to fall down because I don't want to fall down. I don't want to get, I don't get hurt. I don't want to get wet. I, you, you got to guarantee me. And honestly, I really only want to do this for just a few minutes because I, I just got other things on my mind. Can you? And it, this weird silence breaks over the room as they realize the old man is not talking about snowboarding. The old man's talking about school because it's W O R K. And it's H-A-R-D. And that's called L-I-F-E. And Whitman says, why are you walking around the edge with your little piece of wood? Forget about the wood. Let go of the wood and get out there and swim. Notice in the deepest part of the ocean and laughingly dash with the hair and look back at me and go, oh, this is awesome. That's the job of a teacher, he says. And now the final lines. They are the opening lines of passage 47, but they fit together with passage 46, so we read them this way. I am the teacher of athletes. We might say swimmers. We might say swimmers, and in fact, you might write it down as that. I'm the teacher of athletes. He that by me spreads a wider breast than my own proves the width of my own. He most honors my style. Who learns under it to destroy the teacher? Whoa, I'm hoping you underline that phrase destroy the teacher? What does that mean? Let's all go get 12 gauges and go to school and blow away our teachers. No, no, no. I hope not. I hope not. What does it mean? Look at the lines in context. I am the teacher of athletes, swimmers. He that by me spreads a wider breast than my own proves the width of my own. Now, if I were to take you to a pool right now and I ask you to start swimming, when you push that water, you create a breast in the water, a little wave, right? Whitman says the job of the teacher is to help the student to learn how to swim so well that he or she makes a wider breast, a stronger swimmer. It's the job of teachers to help students do it better than the teacher. It's the job of parents to help their kids be better than them, to do more than them to destroy the teacher. In other words, to help the student realize they don't need the teacher anymore. Oh, now that's interesting. The last time, for example, you proved an adult wrong. The adult said X and you went, yeah, it's not right. I'm <laughs> sorry, it's just not right. The answer, it's actually Y. And then the adult went, oh, you're right, it is Y. When that happened for you the last time, did you find the adult say, oh, that is so great. I am so happy that you actually proved me wrong. It's proof of, yeah, see how this works? This is a pretty radical idea. Flip the page over. Look at the other poem about learning. He says, I went to listen to this guy talk about stars in a classroom when I heard the learned astronomer, the proofs, the figures ranged in columns before me, when I was shown the charts, diagrams, the add, divide, measure them. When I sitting heard the astronomer where he lectured with much applause in the lecture room, how soon? Unaccountable. I became tired and sick till rising and gliding out, I wandered off by myself in the mystical moist night air and from time to time looked up in perfect silence at the stars. He said there's two ways to learn. You might jot it down this way. There's two ways to learn. One, to be told about it. The stars, for example. Two, going out and having the experience of the stars. This is what we call experiential learning. Whitman will argue the problem with school is simple. 
you learn stuff in a context where it doesn't seem useful. How many times in your education have you looked up at a teacher and said, when will I ever use this? And Whitman says, that is the correct question. If a teacher can't give you the answer to that in real time, why are you learning it? What is the point? And Whitman says, that's absolutely right. But here's the thing. You don't need a teacher to learn stuff. You can learn stuff on your own. You can learn math on your own. You can learn to read on your own, especially now at your age. You don't need a teacher to, to, to tell you what to do anymore. As a matter of fact, by your junior year on, it's time for you to begin to realize you got to leave the teacher. It's time to go for a swim. To swim better than the teacher, better than the adults in your life. This may account for why some of the adults in your life are pushing you. And the question, well, did you ever do that before? We need you to go to college. Did you ever go to college? No, I didn't go to college. Well, then what are you telling me? Whitman says, because it's the job of a parent to say, do it better than me. Do it better than me. Whitman is also iconoclastic in his religious views. Instead of seeing God as something external to human beings, Whitman sees God as the energy of the universe. And in a passage that could never end up in an anthology, and yet one I love to teach, take a look at it. This is actually passage 48. Wow, 46, 47, 48 of Song of Myself. Three passages that are truly remarkable. Take a look. He says, I have said that the soul is not more than the body, and I've said that the body is not more than the soul. And nothing, what a radical line. Some of you will underline it. Nothing, not God is greater to one than oneself is. The individualism, the independent spirit of Whitman. And whoever walks a furlong without sympathy walks to his own funeral dressed in his shroud. Mean people suck. That's what he says. I hope you underline it and write it that way. Why would you be mean to other people? Have sympathy for other people. Be kind to other people. If you don't, it's like you're dead already, going to be buried in your shroud already. And whoever walks a furlong without sympathy walks to his own funeral dressed in his shroud. And I or you, pocketless of a dime, may purchase the pick of the earth. You do not need a lot of money to be happy. In fact, a lot of money might make you quite the opposite, unhappy. And to glance with an eye or show a bean in its pod confounds the learning of all time. Any scientist will struggle to explain Ruthie's tree. Any scientist will struggle to explain the energy of Ruthie's tree. Where did he come from? Whitman says, the simple things prove that the world is so remarkable. How can you say that life is boring? Look at the next one. There's no trade or employment work, but that the young man, and we would say today, woman, following it may become a hero. Whatever job you have to do, even if it's working at the Big Mac, do it like a hero. Whatever job. Other people might look at you and go, oh, that's a crappy job. And you say, there are no crappy jobs. A job is important to defining who you are. It's not about the money. It's not about the money. Did my Mikey get paid any money to learn to ride a bike? Not a dime. Why did he learn to ride a bike? Because it was F-U-N. Not when he fell, it wasn't. And jobs are F-U-N. When you learn how to see them as the thing that makes you who you are, you could do nothing greater in your life than learn the joy of work. Hard work. The great president, Teddy Roosevelt, said, there's nothing so beautiful as doing a job worth doing. Nothing so amazing as working hard at something and accomplishing something. Even if it's a lowly job, it doesn't matter. Where Whitman, there are no lowly jobs, but remember, he grew up on construction sites. Yeah? Every time Whitman saw a building, he saw the men and women who helped him make it, not just the men and women who lived inside of it. Right? Notice the next one. He says... There's no object so soft, but it makes a hub for the wheeled universe. Everything matters. Even the weak, even the soft matters. And I say to any man or woman, let your soul stand cool and composed before a million universes. Don't fear. Don't fear the future and don't fear the universe. And I say to mankind, be not curious about God, for I who am curious about each am not curious about God. No array of terms can say how much I am at peace about God and about death. I hear and behold God in every object, yet understand God not in the least. Nor do I understand who there could be more wonderful than myself. Why should I wish to see God better than this day? I see something of God each hour of the 24 and each moment then. In the faces of men and women, I see God in my own face in the glass. 
I find letters from God dropped in the street and everyone is signed by God's name. I leave them where they are, for I know that wheresoever I go, others will punctually come forever and ever. Pretty radical view of his view of deity. So, to now finish our comments. Whitman, the great American poet, brings what in 1855? In a word, energy. Energy, passion. A conviction that life is worth living. And he will write until he dies in 1892 to try to convince not only people of his time, but readers of generations to come, that life is worth living. And there is a reason to get up in the morning, and it's called your life. And the source of joy in your life will come in the struggle, through the pain, through the fear, in spite of all of that, to wash the gum from your eyes and to have it yourself to the dazzle of the light. Thank you. An introduction to Whitman. When we come back, we'll return to preface and then on to the, some of the poems of Leaves of Grass. Thank you.